excited. I want to thank you all to this workshop on Saint, Saint John Paul II, Theology of the Body. That's so wonderful to be able to say that here in the Diocese of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my name is Katrina Zeno. I'm going to do something I've never done before, which is I'm going to read my own introduction to you. A lot of times I just kind of informally introduce myself, but I realize when I do that, sometimes I miss a few things. So I will... I will read my own introduction here. So Katrina Zeno, MTS, is the coordinator of the John Paul II Resource Center for Theology of the Body and Culture for the Diocese of Phoenix, Arizona, and a very recent graduate of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies in Marriage and Family in Washington, DC. So thank you for all of you who prayed for me over these last two years during my absence from this diocese. It was very difficult to be gone from you all, so I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Thanks, Nika. So I'm very happy to be back. Uh, I am also the co-foundress of Women of the Third Millennium, as well as the founder of a new outreach of mine entitled Theology of the Body for Everyone.com. Uh, Katrina, myself, co-hosted a 13-part series on EWTN on John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And I am the author of Discovering the Feminine Genius, Every Woman's Journey, The Body Reveals God, and When Life Doesn't Go Your Way. As an inter international speaker, I've spoken across the United States and Canada, and in Switzerland, Austria, England, Guatemala, Rome, Slovakia, and Trinidad. And I was born and raised in San Diego, beautiful, beautiful San Diego, California, and I earned my bachelor's in theology from Franciscan University, of Steubenville, and I lived in Steubenville, Ohio for 23 years before I moved to Phoenix in 2005. As some of you may know, I love to dance, so I'm also a swing dance instructor and an Argentine tango enthusiast. I also love to dance salsa, and I'm the blessed mother of a now married son, Michael. So please join me in welcoming Katrina Zeno. <laughs> So it is really wonderful to be with you all uh, this evening in this workshop uh, in which I trust that we are going to become rather uh, intimate friends in this very intense topic of Theology of the Body over tonight and tomorrow. However, I wanted to start off with something that uh, is uh, not quite so intense. It is a little video entitled, uh, She Poked My Heart. And I just ask you to watch it because it's something that I'm going to refer back to. And every once in a while, it's helpful to use an image rather than words. You're going to hear lots of words from me. I love to teach. I love to speak. But it's really important that words also go with images. I mean, that's what it means to be Catholic, because that's what it is to uh, have a sacramental understanding of life in the world. Sacraments always have something that's visible and tangible along with words. So words and uh, deeds, words and concrete and images go together. All right, so um, it, if, it might be hard at first to understand what they're saying, but what they're, they're arguing over whether it's sprinkling or raining outside. I think those are the two. So you'll notice that that's what they're arguing over, but be sure to watch um, to the very end. So what are your thoughts? <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure it's not sprinkling? What struck you watching it? They're both talking about the same thing. They're both talking about the same thing? Mm hmm What else? The woman is the man. The woman what? The girl was in the man. Yeah, yes. Uh-huh. But what changed? When did when did the whole conversation change? Yeah, when there was a physical interaction, his heart. I found that fascinating, because did she hurt him when she poked him? It didn't look like. No, it didn't look like it. I mean, it looked like just, you know, a little poke. But notice, all of a sudden, she touched his person. There was a difference between just the words and then suddenly an interaction with his person, that when she actually touched and encountered his body, she somehow touched and encountered his person. 
I think that's a pretty profound image of really what theology of the body is all about, is that it's all about encountering the person through the body. Words are important. I mean, without words, we probably wouldn't be here at this workshop. And yet what John Paul II wants to emphasize, because it's a theology of the body, is how, is how and who we encounter through the body. So I just ask you to kind of just keep that interaction in mind as we go along. So my hope is that this workshop, in a good way, will, po will poke your heart. You know, not in, not in a way that you feel offended, uh, but will poke your heart. And that over these next two days, it won't just be a matter of words, of intellectual concepts. We're going to have lots and lots of those. Um, but that an interior change, an interior transformation will begin, which is why I say, I hope that your heart gets poked. I hope that your heart is reached. So with your permission, despite what, how I advertised what this workshop is, uh, with your permission, I'd like to just slightly change the title of the workshop, as you can see perhaps on the cover of your workbook, to Transformed by Theology of the Body. I didn't want to put poked by Theology of the Body. I didn't quite think that would work so well. But Transformed by Theology of the Body, a fresh encounter with the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's really what theology of the body is. It's an invitation to the heart to encounter the living Christ. So is that all right with you if I slightly change the title? Whew, I'm so glad. Okay, Otherwise, I might have to, have to have you mark out the front of your workbooks. So why do I propose that change? Well, it's for a couple reasons. One, because as you know, the Synod on the Family is currently meeting in Rome. Even as we speak, it's drawing to a close. It'll conclude on Sunday, October 19th, 2014. And in a good way, much of what has been discussed in the Synod has to do with language, with how to present church doctrine. And here's a, a summary from the Vatican's unofficial translation of what took place on October 7th. So uh, as you know, the bishops have been discussing, and this is one way to describe what they've been discussing, how to present church doctrine so as to, I quote, reduce the gap between doctrine and practice, between the teachings of the church and the daily life of families. That's really critical. But listen to that, the gap between doctrine and practice. When I first read that, it was like, ouch, that we have this gap between what the church believes and teaches and how people actually live their daily life. Uh, according to the Synod, the challenge is that of reviving the capacity for proposing the heritage of the faith with a new language, and I like this, and creating a bridge between the language of the church and that of society. Do you ever think that it occurs that the church speaks and people don't pay any attention because the language doesn't mean anything? Okay, a number of you are smiling. <laughs> so again, the Synod recognizes that we need to create a bridge between the language of the church and the language that society is able to hear. Here's a way we could put it. Not just speak words that people sometimes hear and then dismiss, but perhaps to actually do what? to poke people's hearts with a new, fresh language so that people's lives are transformed by an encounter with the living Christ. That's what language has the possibility of doing, to actually penetrate. What do we hear in the gospel today? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Why? Because what does leaven do? It, right, it grows. It pervades, it penetrates throughout the whole loaf. Otherwise, nothing happens to the loaf of bread. This is what we're, our hope, the hope for the synod, is that we can come up with a fresh way of presenting the doctrine, the teaching of the church, so that people can hear it. This is what Pope Francis is all about. You want to know what Pope Francis is all about? This is it. The gospel is just for a select 1% of the people in the world. Absolutely not. For Francis, the gospel is for everyone, for everyone. 
If you listen carefully to what he says, that's what he says over and over and over and over again. And so too, theology of the body has the potential to present the gospel to everyone through a new and fresh language. So I think it's fascinating to read at this point in history the opening two sentences of Theology of the Body. So please open up your workbook, and you'll see it has the quotes there from the Synod. And now here are the opening two sentences from Theology of the Body. For some time now, preparations have been underway for the next ordinary assembly of the Synod of Bishops, which will take place in Rome in the fall of next year, meaning in the fall of 1980. The topic of the Synod, the role or the task of the Christian family, will focus our attention on this community of human and Christian life, which has been fundamental from the beginning. Almost sounds like it could have been written two weeks ago, huh? So John Paul II began giving theology of the body with an eye to the fact that there was going to be a synod in Rome a year later on the family. And here we are in the midst of a synod in Rome on the family. So I think it's rather prophetic that we're here at this point in time looking at this. So I think it's very legitimate to say that the issues that John Paul II sought to address in Theology of the Body, now a couple decades ago, are still similar to the issues that the bishops are addressing now. And therefore, Theology of the Body, I would propose, continues to have an irreplaceable contribution to make in bridging that gap between church doctrine and daily life. That's the gap I hope we can bridge this weekend between the language of the church and the language of society. Does that interest any of you? Good. I'm glad at least a couple of you nodded your heads. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's start with a little experiment in terms of uh, just kind of waking ourselves up. It's Friday night. I'm so sorry. I always hate starting a workshop on Friday night. But please believe me when I say it's much better to get two hours out of the way Friday night than to try to cram all of this in on Saturday. So you will thank yourself, and maybe you'll thank me by the time we're done. Uh, OK, so you'll notice in your workbook that there are a few blank lines. So I'm going to say a word, and I want you to write down the first word that pops into your mind. So just a way of kind of getting our brains in gear. So I'll wait till you all have your pens ready and your workbooks. OK, so here we go. First word that pops into your mind on that first line and just go down. OK, first word, lasagna. Next word, snow. Next word, wrestling. Next word, blue. Next word, lipstick. Next word, theology of the body. OK, what did someone write for lasagna? Food. Food. <laughs> what else? Italian. Italian, great. What about snow? Oh. <laughs> People after my own heart. <laughs> Jacket. OK, what was the next one? Wrestling? OK, what would you write for wrestling? Titans. Titans. <laughs> what was it? Stirring. Stirring? Stirring. Okay. Sweating. What was it? Sweating. Sweating. I love it. Okay. I think the next word was blue. Would you write? Sky. 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 Mary. Mary. Blazer. Blazer. Ocean. I like that ocean. And what about lipstick? <laughs> Do, Do we have any psychologists in here? This is a really fascinating study, huh? Okay. And how about the last one? Theology of the body. Katrina Zena. John Paul II. What else? Who is it? What? What else? God. God? Life giving. What was it? Life giving. Life giving. Jesus. Jesus. Word made flesh. Word made flesh. What else? God. What is it? Reveals, Reveals God. God. Great. Did anyone write the word sex? So you know if we had done this. Uh, exercise, perhaps somewhere other than the Diocese of Phoenix, <laughs> or perhaps a few years ago, that would have been a pretty common response. I still think that when many people hear theology of the body, 
the first word that pops into their mind is sex. And I think it's really important to recognize that while theology of the body does treat of sex and sexual morality, that those are a dimension of it, that John Paul II's intention is much broader than that. And my hope is that after this workshop, when you hear theology of the body, that words like gift and union and communion and GS24, Trinitarian love, the body reveals God. My hope is that those are the kinds of words that will pop into your mind whenever you hear theology of the body. So tonight, before we started, who here had heard of theology of the body before? Oh, that's a good sign. OK. Before you read about it, wherever you read about this workshop, who'd never heard of theology of the body before? OK. Great. Wonderful. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, I was counting up the years in terms of how long ago I started speaking on Theology of the Body. I think it was 17 or 18. So really, when I actually, when I first started speaking on Theology of the Body, people would say, well, what do you speak on? I'd say Theolo Theology of the Body. I'd get blank looks. And I eventually just jettisoned that term and didn't even use it because it meant nothing. And so I just would say, I speak on John Paul II's writings and his writings about women. So it's a great joy to see that you know, slowly it's spreading. So who here has read Theology of the Body? This little book here from cover to cover. Oh my, OK. Uh, who's never, ever even attempted to read Theology of the Body from cover to cover? OK, raise your hands high. There, there's no shame in that. Great. Who has tried to read it, picked it up, and put it down because it was so difficult? Right, OK, that's the pretty common. That's the more common response. And you know, I'm just going to turn the volume down just a bit. So yes, most people's experiences, they try to pick up John Paul II and read him. I always like to say, I'll never be out of work. Thank you, John Paul II. <laughs> um, so I want to look at John Paul II's intention for this actually really big book here. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, I'm an author. And uh, a number, uh, my books are often used in book studies, especially for women, especially the book Discovering the Feminine Genius. So I'd like to ask you if there's someone who's leading a book study on my book Discovering the Feminine Genius, tell me, is it my hope as the author that the facilitator of the book study will give her own interpretation of what I've written? Or is it my hope that she will be faithful to my intention and meaning as the author? Which do you think I would prefer? Second. Yeah, the second. I hope that she'd be faithful to my intention as the author. I think the same is true with John Paul II, that it's really important, as difficult as the language is, that we try to be faithful to his intention as the author. And fortunately, he doesn't leave us in the dark, although sometimes it might be hard to try to find it in all those audiences. So in your workbook, in audience 13, here's what John Paul II states. I'm sorry, well, in audience 13, he states that what he wants to do is develop an adequate anthropology. Now, when we hear the word adequate, to our ears, ears it kind of means, eh, so-so. You know, how was, you know, the dinner? Eh, it was adequate. How was the lasagna? Eh, it was, you know, it was adequate. It was passable. But when John Paul II says in audience 13, he's interested in an adequate anthropology, that's not what he means. He doesn't mean just so-so. He means an understanding of the human person and a way of speaking about the understanding of, hum of the human person is the word anthropology. So when we say an anthropology, what we mean is what it is to be a human person. So he wants an understanding of the human person that encompasses the whole truth and reality of what it means to be a human person. So adequate for him means whole truth. This is what I like to call a robust Trinitarian sacramental anthropology. OK, I just thought maybe we ought to expand it out a little bit. So really, my goal in this workshop is to take John Paul II's adequate anthropology and show how it's a robust Trinitarian sacramental anthropology. Who here likes wine? Oh, great. OK, we're all in good company here. Is there a difference between a robust red wine and just kind of a so-so red wine? Yeah, of course there is. The problem with a so-so red wine is it doesn't hold up. Like, I love spicy food. And if I just have kind of, you're smiling, I love it. If I just kind of have like a so-so Merlot with my spicy food, 
it, it, it's just going to disappear, right? I'll, I'll eat the spicy food, I'll take a drink of the so-so red wine, and it, it really doesn't hang around much. If I have a really good Cabernet Sauvignon, like a really robust one, and I'm eating my spicy Thai food, okay, it can hold up to the task because it's got this great body. It sticks around, right? It's full. So that's what I would like to propose John Paul II's anthropology is. It's up to the task. What's the task? The task is trying to respond to this gap between church doctrine and daily life, between church language and the language people use in everyday life in society. And the, church, the language used in everyday life in society at the moment is really undermining I mean, we could give all kinds of examples, couldn't we? It's things that happened even today in Arizona, and even the way that the media has been portraying the Synod on the family, undermining it with the language. And so what we need is this robust Trinitarian anthropology that can stand up to the misunderstanding and the misrepresenting of the human person and church teaching. So that's why it's fabulous that you're here. It's fabulous that those people who are watching this on YouTube or wherever they're seeing this video, you know, have a chance to come along with us. One of the things that uh, I've noticed about Theology of the Body most recently is that there are two things that I have found helpful to help us mm, kind of diagnose and understand John Paul II's difficult concepts and vocabulary so that these can take root in us and grow. And these are foundational principles and what I like to call PTs, Pope terms. So again, with your permission, I'd like to call the foundational principles FOPs, F-O-P, foundational principle. So part of what we're going to do is we're going to look at FOPs, at foundational principles, and what these do is they provide the um, undercurrent, or they provide the undergirding for theology of the body. They're not obvious. Like John Paul II doesn't stop and say, okay, now here's foundational principle number one. They're just assumed. It's kind of like a scaffolding around which theology of the body is built. So part of my job as a teacher is to try to identify those foundational principles so that as we're going through theology of the body, we can see, OK, this is what he's talking about. And then my other job is to identify his vocabulary and his terms, which is why I like to call them PTs or Pope terms. OK, so let's look at FOP number one. Foundational principle number one, it's in your workbook. It's that the body is not only biological, but theological. So you'll notice that I have blanks in your workbook. Uh, it's so that you can track along with me and so that in case you're tempted to nap off, uh, you won't so that you don't miss filling in a blank. So the body is not only biological but theological. What does that mean? Let's jump right into the text of Theology of the Body, but we're going to go to the middle, audience 69, because and in the middle, John Paul II stops and he, he takes stock of what he's been doing. So he stops and he looks back at what he's spoken on or what he's written so far up to that point. So let's read audience 69 from number six. So in Theology of the Body, you'll notice in your workbook, workbook let's try it again. In your workbooks, I've listed the audience and then there's a colon or a dash and a number. That number refers to the section. It doesn't refer to the paragraph because a, a section might have three or four paragraphs. So audience 69, section three, or part three, section three, it might be the first paragraph, it might be the second paragraph of that. So just so you know, that's the way I'm referring to it. So audience 69, section six. It is clear that what is at issue here is not the body in the abstract, but man, who is both spiritual and bodily. We can make a certain theological reconstruction of what might have been the experience of the body on the basis of man's revealed beginning and also what it will be in the dimension of the other world. The possibility of such a reconstruction which extends our experience of man body 
indicates at least indirectly the coherence of the theological image of man in these three dimensions, which come together in constituting the theology of the body. Rah, rah, huh? It all makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You know what? It will by the time we get back to that. Right? This is what kind of makes John Paul II difficult, isn't it? Is that, whoa, he says he doesn't want to talk about in the abstract, and yet it sounds like he's talking in the abstract. But what he's actually doing is reviewing what he's done in the first three panels of Theology of the Body. So his first three panels he calls a triptych. And a triptych is a three-paneled painting or altarpiece. And so what he's just done is given us a quick review of who the man, of, about that the body tells us something, not only in man's beginning, but notice the possibility of such a reconstruction would extend our experience of man body at least in three dimensions. So what are those three dimensions? Okay, so I'm going to go over to this far um, chalkboard, and I know it's pitched a little bit, and it's because I can't get it to turn, and the other side someone used a permanent marker, so I can't use the other side. All right. And then I'll get back, I'll be using this one periodically. But what I'd like you to do is to please turn to the inside cover of your workbooks and turn it long ways and to sketch out this structure of theology of the body with me so you can refer back to it as we go along. So theology of the body, so what we want to look at is how it's laid out by John Paul II. Again, the author's intention uh, so, John, so theology of the body has two halves, kind of like the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. All right, so if you just make a really long rectangle and divide it in half. The first half, John Paul II entitles the words of Christ. And I'll use an X for Christ, it's just easier. And the second half he entitles the sacrament. Okay, so two halves. We just heard... The first half, he talks about man in his three dimensions, or what he calls his triptych. So if you'll take and you'll divide this into three, please. What are those three dimensions that John Paul II wants to treat of, of the human person? The first panel is who we are before original sin. The second panel is who we are uh, is after original sin. The third panel is who we will be forever in heaven. So what is the end game? Where is it all going? Uh, the second half, uh, for, for our purposes at the moment, we're going to divide it in half. And so panel four is the sacramentality of marriage. Sacramentality of marriage. And then the very last panel are his reflections on humanae vitae. And if you're not familiar with humanae vitae, it is Paul VI encyclical, 1968, on human life. Most often referred to as the birth control encyclical, but that's really incorrect. It's about the responsible transmission of human life. So that's the sketch of where we're going over this workshop. And so John Paul II from, says this is his intention. His intention is to begin by looking at man in these three dimensions, who we are before original sin, after original sin, who we will be forever in heaven. So when John Paul II says the body is not only biological but theological, what he means is it's not sufficient to define the human person only according to what's material or what's physical. So in creating this robust Trinitarian anthropology, if it's not adequate only to refer to what's material or physical, does that mean that what's material and physical is unimportant? That the natural we just kind of leave behind and go only to the supernatural, only to the spiritual? The answer is no, not at all. And that leaves to FOP number two, foundational principle number two. Who can complete this sentence for me? Grace? Blank nature. What is it? Perfects. perfects. Grace perfects nature. For years and years and years, I heard that quoted as grace builds on nature. That's incorrect. 
It's actually grace perfects nature. If we grasp this truth, I think it can transform the whole way we understand ourselves and all creation and especially the body. Because the Catholic Church teaches that grace, what's spiritual, doesn't get rid of or discard or overwhelm or override nature so that human nature becomes irrelevant and only the soul is important. I think, unfortunately, this is a very, very common understanding that what really matters about you is your soul. And your body is just kind of extra. It's really not critical. Really? What happened? Poked his heart. The body matters. That, this is what the Catholic faith, Christian faith, understands. Is that when it comes to the visible world, here's what's interesting. You can't have the supernatural without the natural. In the created order. We're talking about in this created order, you can't have the supernatural without the natural. Why do I say that? What happens when angels want to come into this created order? Do they appear as pure spirits? No, what do they have to do? They have to take on a body. Do you see? The supernatural, in order to express itself in the created order, has to take on the natural. You can't 